three or four themes. The first is about what is right and what is wrong, and uh, what is good and what is bad, and what is morality, what are taboos, and what is the role of values and the role of institutions. That's one broad subset of themes. The second is, as the blurb said, politics and corruption. You cannot escape those two things, unfortunately, in India today. Therefore, politics and corruption, without going into party politics, but the broader issue of politics. The third is our nation and our society. And the fourth is this collision of spiritual and the temporal worlds. Oh, you better be ready for a whole night then. <laughs> uh, if I may start off with the first um, line of inquiry, Sadhguru. 
when you were a person of religion, you were, you were given certain edicts, what is good, what is bad, the Ten Commandments, the do's and the don'ts. But in ordinary life, for most people, particularly in the public domain, to distinguish between good and bad seems to be increasingly difficult. I always held that there are two realms, the individual, individual gain, and the second is the public good. If one is clashing with the other, if my personal gain is clashing with the public good, then that is something bad. If both are in harmony, then that is something good. That seems to me to be a workable definition of what is good and bad for ordinary interaction between the citizen or individual and the community and the society. What are your thoughts on that? So once you start a, a debate as to what is good and what is bad, actually in reality, this debate can go on forever without coming to a conclusion. Obviously, you have debated this within yourself and around yourself for many years and still there's no conclusion. And believe me, people have been debating this for thousands of years and still there is no conclusion. Why this is so is? Generally, this starts from within the family. It starts from within the family, that is, uh, people who have the authority within the family. If you really carefully look at it, essentially it boils down to this, what I do is good, what you do is bad. <laughs> that extends to the society, to politics, to various things. Whoever is in a position of power, who is in a position of dominance, they may not spell it out so crudely, but in so many ways they're telling you, what I do is right, what you do is wrong. So ultimately it becomes about whoever is in a state of advantage is right, whoever is in a state of disadvantage is wrong. Well, that principle is the basis of all exploitation and all the ugliness that you see on the planet. So instead of starting a debate on what is good and what is bad, I think what we need is what is appropriate and what is inappropriate to our times, to our society, to our existence here, to our level of economics, what is right and what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. Now, if uh, I'm just saying for example, we are, uh, you know, we are, uh, we are a rich nation because if you have twenty-nine rupees per day, you are rich in this country. So we are one rich nation, another rich nation is United States. So between these two, if you compare, what may be right there is not right here because the conditions are not same, people's lives are not same, culture is not same, people's emotions are not same, people's wants, likes and dislikes are not same. So what is right there may be completely wrong here. What is right here may be completely wrong there. So within the nation, when we say a nation, we believe we are all Indians, but here everybody has an opinion of his own. Don't… <laughs> don't have… I mean, it's… it will be fanciful to think there is one person here who doesn't have an opinion of his own who goes by Indian constitution. There's not one single person like that here. Everybody has their own opinion, their own twist of what is right and wrong, isn't it? 1.2 billion people, every one of them <laughs> has their own opinions. Two people cannot agree as to what's right and wrong. So instead of looking at right and wrong, if we start looking at what is appropriate, okay, these are our conditions, this is our life, what is the most appropriate thing to do right now? Tomorrow if our conditions change, the appropriateness changes, then there will be no clashes. Constantly the clash between the previous generation and this generation, between one human being and the other human being is, your ideas of right and his ideas of right are so different. Parents and children are fighting, administration and people are fighting, management and union is fighting, simply because your ideas of good and bad are very different and it's always different. Within the family, between the husband and the wife, basic unit of the family, 
their ideas of right and wrong are very different. So once you enter that space, you are entering into an endless controversy, no possibility of a solution. But if you look at appropriateness of action, then we can arrive at what is the appropriate thing to do in our society, for our conditions, for our limitations. Now, Sadhguru, I hear you saying that A, the cultural ambience in which you live, that matters about the appropriateness, and B, it changes from time to time, generation yes. to generation. In other words, people sometimes confuse taboos with morals, the changing passions and attitudes with morals. But unless we have some kind of a yardstick which is measurable and somewhat universal in guiding our behavior and dealing with the society at large, or perhaps even in nature, how are we going to give people a yardstick other than religious edicts? That is a challenge for many agnosts because we can't go by the Ten Commandments merely because God gave us those. We can't go by the Gita because Lord Vishnu told us so. We need a, a temporal yardstick. We need an institutional mechanism to be able to measure and say this is right, this is wrong, a talisman. We need to understand this. Right now, we are trying to let it. It's never worked. Even the Ten Commandments that you are referring to repeatedly has never worked. It's only carved in the stone. Nobody has ever really stuck to it, believe me. <laughs> People who said, thou shall not kill are the ones who are killing constantly. It is just that it will happen in a different garb, in a different way. So if trying to fix the human societies with morality, will only bring more and more deception. And above all, it kills life in so many different ways. Why are we trying to fix life with morality? Essentially because we have never bothered to stir up humanity. There is something called as humanity within us. If you stir up this dimension which we call as humanity, when somebody is feeling very human, he doesn't need morality he will be fine the way he is. But instead of being a human being, he becomes a Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim or an Indian or a Pakistani or this or that or so many things, caste, creed and many, many things. So instead of a human identity, he takes on a different identity. Now you can do most horrible things with great pride. Yes, you can kill. Thousands, not one, you can kill thousands and feel really good about it. I did it because I did it for the nation, I did it for my religion, I did it for my caste, creed, whatever else. So your identity is shifting from your fundamental identity to make-believe identities. It may serve limited purpose. We are a nation because we have to politically manage ourselves. It is not some... Uh, divine dictum that this is a nation like this. We are the people who draw, drew the lines, isn't it? Now we believe that's how it is. For certain functional realities we draw lines, but that is not the reality. So a human being should essentially be identified as a human being, not by his religion, not by his race, not by his caste, creed, nationality, no. If he sits here as a human being, you don't… you will see he does not need morality, he will be fine. And that's what is needed in the society, to stir up humanity, not morality. That's it. That, that's it. Terrific message, um, Sadhguru. Essentially what you're advocating is that go beyond the individual, go beyond the sect and the creed and embrace humanity itself. And you will not go wrong in your actions. Uh, I'm decisions. not saying embrace humanity. I'm saying you are human, isn't it? I don't have to teach you to be human. You are human. The problem is somebody else has taught you that you are something else. Somebody else has told you you're Indian. Somebody else has told you you're Hindu. Somebody else has told you you're Muslim. But the reality is you're human. If you go little further, you're just a piece of life, isn't it? 
if you sit here as a piece of life, do you have any problem with any piece of life in the existence? If you sit here and throb as a piece of life, which is what's happening, it doesn't matter, we are talking something, whatever we may be talking, essentially, we are sitting here as throbbing as a piece of life. Rest is all made up by us, isn't it? This is the reality of existence. If you sit here as a piece of life, you instantly know that there is nothing in the existence with which you are not connected. But if you sit here as an Indian, if the person is sitting next to you is P, there's problem. If you sit here as a Hindu, if the next person is M, problem. Like this it goes on, it doesn't stop there. It goes into further and further divisions and divisions and divisions. So, essential dimension of spiritual process is that you disidentify yourself with all the false identities you have taken on and to learn to sit here just as a piece of life. If you sit here as a piece of life and throb as a piece of life, breathe as a piece of life, you know this happened a few years ago because you mentioned this project Green Hands, I'm bringing this on. When I said that we need to plant 114 million trees, to get Tamil Nadu to thirty-three percent green cover, people said, Sadhguru, do you know what is one hundred and fourteen million? Is it possible for any human being to plant this many? See, I told them, the population of Tamil Nadu is six point two million, sixty-two million, I'm sorry, sixty-two million people. If all of us plant one tree, take care of it for two years and plant one more tree, what is the number? You got it. So it's not difficult, even a beggar is capable of planting one tree, isn't it? Now the problem is that they must feel for it. How do you do it? I told them, you don't worry. I went out village to village, called farmers associations together. I told them one simple thing, just sit here. Where do you want to sit? In the sun or under the tree? Choose. You know what's the choice. Everybody sits under the tree. Now I said, see, you are you breathing? Yes. I want you to understand what you exhale, the tree is inhaling. What the tree is exhaling, you are inhaling. Just sit here and feel it, it's happening. One half of your lungs is hanging out there. Your breathing equipment is not completely here. Only one half is here, one half is hanging out there. Just see the tree and breathe. It just caught like a fire. We have not planted one and fourteen million trees, but seventeen million trees. and. Tamil Nadu's green cover has officially gone up by 7.2 percent. And we didn't give up our lives to do this, this is just one of the small things we do. This is just one aspect of our activity. We didn't give up our life to do this. Just that if everybody gets involved, it's such a small job, isn't it? If everybody gets involved, it's such a small job. Why are they not getting involved? because they're identified with something. If they sat here as a piece of life, nobody had to tell them. They would have anyway done it by themselves. So, it is because of these wrong identifications that we are doing all these crazy things and you're trying to fix it with morality, it's not going to work. It's not worked for these thousands of years, isn't it? So the best thing is, first step is to stir up your humanity. If that is done, the next thing is, to see that you're just a piece of life, even, even being human is your idea. Well, the theory of evolution was… is telling you, just some time ago you were a monkey. I'm sorry, not me, Charles Darwin <laughs> Just some time ago you were a monkey and the difference between you and a chimpanzee, your DNA is only 1.23 percent different from that of a uh, chimpanzee. Not a big difference, isn't it? After all, they're your relatives still. Many of your relatives look like that, isn't it, when you don't like them <laughs> So, experiencing life as life is more important than we making up something which is not true. This is what has happened to human society. This is what has happened to human psyche, that they are not sitting here as life. They are sitting here as so many things which they are not. They realize this only when they die. Sadhguru, as a parochial aside, I wish Isha Foundation is in Andhra Pradesh so that you would have got the benefit of the tree plantation. I am in Andhra Pradesh things. right now. 
<laughs> I hope these seeds will truly spread. Sadhguru, that brings me to the question of ensuring that the moral conduct is actually upheld while spiritual gurus, religion itself, and societal norms have value, they don't seem to be sufficient. Only in India, whenever you talk about corruption or some other misconduct in public life or in private life, we talk of morality and values instead of talking no, about institutions. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no corruption in India. Where is corruption in India? There is only banditry. I don't see any corruption. <laughs> but, but, but in order to… in order to… Because corruption means you come to me and you want a favor to be done, I'm willing to do it, this but you know, under the table I want two rupees from you. This is corruption. Is I break your head and I take everything that you have, this is not corruption. It's just plunder. <laughs> so that when we… when we talk of uh, all these evils in the public domain, Oftentimes, you talk of values in this country rather than enforcing a certain code of conduct. There's something that troubles people like me because if indeed values without any external compulsion can be internalized and they can guide the behavior of every single human being, they probably guide the behavior of a large majority of people because if there is peace in this country, if all of us are going to go back homes after this uh, session, with a reasonable degree of certainty that there will be not… Um, there will not be any victims of violence, it's because the society has these norms and values. But there's always deviant behavior in society. Unless the laws of the land, unless the enforcement mechanism are strong enough to enforce a certain code of conduct and prove that there is punishment for bad behavior and reward for good behavior, I'm afraid values in themselves will not for long sustain us. Not at all. Now, this is something that we need to get from you because overemphasis on values at the cost of institutions sometimes may actually become an excuse for doing nothing to build institutions. It's a bit like this water in the glass. The water is obviously the one that is giving life. Without that, we can't fix the thirst. But without the glass, without the container, the water is not usable. While water is what gives life, the container, the institutions are what make the life the, the, the value usable. So my appeal to you is, A, give us a, your, your views and if you broadly think that this is the right approach, what institutional mechanisms we need to build in your estimate to build higher levels of public integrity, higher levels of civic conduct? See, one important thing that India needs to do is to simplify the laws in a way that everybody understands it. Right now it's so… so complex and so ambiguous, nobody really knows what it is. And because it's… there is so much ambiguity, it creates so much gray areas which breeds corruption endlessly. If there is no ambiguity, Somebody just couldn't come and ask money out of me to do some work, isn't it? There is so much ambiguity. These laws were largely created by the English because they wanted ambiguity so that they could interpret it whichever way they want. If they want to pick you up tomorrow morning, they want to pick you up and there's a good enough reason. We have still kept the same laws and even today it is true, the law can just come and pick you or me up now and I don't know what I have done, but you can pick you up and they can produce something, number, whatever, criminal procedure code, some damn number that I'm not aware of, and they can say, you did this. Because it's such an ambiguous law, this is good to control foreign nations if you occupy them, not for our nation to move ahead. Too much ambiguity. I… I… to give you an example, see if you… I'm sure uh, there are people involved in various kinds of real estate is one of the big activities happening. If you want to… I don't know how long it takes in Andhra Pradesh, normally in Tamil Nadu it takes twelve to fourteen months to get an approval for a building. 
Many things would have changed in fourteen months' time. You may be no more interested to build in fourteen months' time. You go through some sixteen departments and you have to put people to follow this file every day, where it is going. And of course there is a fixed fee, beyond the fee. All that you do, still fourteen months. In the end, you have spent so much, you have spent so much time, with vengeance you break the law. You understand? <laughs> Just with vengeance because you… you spent so much money. If you say ten thousand square feet, I want to build fifteen thousand square feet because anyway I've paid you, what is the big deal? It comes to that. So all laws are flouted without any problem. In United States we are building, you know, we are building a big center. Here if you go, they have a code book, building code. Your… your architect anyway has to be certified, he must know the codes. Apart from that, a code book is given to you about two hundred fifty pages. You better read it. You build whatever you want, no department, no sanction. You build whatever you want, but before occupation, he will come for an inspection. If it's by the code, it's fine. If it's not by the code, your building goes down and you go in. Simple. So now the amount of government machinery that is needed just to sanction a building is cut down to just a few people rather than these various departments. If I'm a citizen of this country, why do you think I'm naturally a criminal? Why are you sanctioning what I should do, what I should not do? Just tell me this is the way to build in this country, I will build that way. If I don't, bring it down. I I'm just saying as one example. You can see million examples like this in the country where laws are unnecessarily complicated and ambiguous, which is essentially breeding ground for corruption. Sadhguru, the saying in Andhra Pradesh is in Tamil Nadu, you give you a bribe and your work gets done. Don't tell me. <laughs> in Andhra Pradesh, you give you a bribe and still you are harassed. So there are still grades and grades in this corruption phenomena in this country. Sadhguru, before we go into the issue of politics and uh, corruption, because all of us love to hate politicians. Uh, I… I wouldn't allow that because it's become a fashion and a fad and almost a compulsion that wherever you go, people are talking politics. How horrible the politicians are, whether they know about it or they don't know about it, from a tea shop to an office and wherever else it's happening. If you are a responsible citizen, what democracy means is, it is the people's government. These politicians did not land from the sky, they are one among you who stood up to do something. Now for whatever reasons they've become the way they've become, you do not know how many have become like that, how many not. We are generalizing because we have a certain pleasure in painting everything very bleak and black. If your nation is important for you and if you believe that you have handed over your nation to a bunch of crooks and you are sitting here and it's entertainment for you, I think it is you who needs to be punished, not the corrupt. Because democracy cannot be a spectator sport, it is a participatory process. If I say participatory, most people's understanding of this is if I come out once in five years and vote, my responsibility is over. No, democracy has various instruments through which you can participate on a daily basis in the governance of your country, your state, your city and your street. There are various mechanisms. Oh, I don't know. Why you don't know? Because you're not cared, isn't it? Why you have not educated yourself to know is you have not cared because the idea of the nation has not gone deep enough in this country. Still, our identifications with our religions, our caste, our creed, our family is more predominant than the ide identity of the nation. This is the reason why these things are happening. I don't know if I can share this, but let me try it out because this happened in Andhra Pradesh. 
I was traveling with a lady who comes from a political family in Andhra Pradesh. I was just… Uh, I saw the way things were going on in the family and stuff and I just joked, if you are given a choice, probably your father will break the country into four pieces and give it to the four children that he has. You… I was amazed and shocked, I didn't know what… I don't know how to articulate this expression. The person was actually genuinely said, what is wrong with that? Our father loves us. <laughs> it's my birthright <laughs> Yes. Now, what we need to understand is, we as a nation are moving from a feudalistic existence to a democratic existence. The system has changed, but our mind has not changed. We are still feudalistic. People are complaining, not everybody, a lot of people are complaining. Their complaint is only that we didn't get the chance to be corrupt. <laughs> we are at the receiving end or the giving end. They are not complaining that there is corruption, really, I'm telling you.